All right, guys, today we are continuing our 10 second Trailblazer build. Our goal is to make this 2008 Trailblazer go tens in the quarter mile and be the ultimate street car. Now, if you guys have followed the channel for a little while, you know that we are big fans of these Vortec 4200s that came standard in the Chevy Trailblazer. And this will be our first time boosting it in its natural habitat. The only issue is this one. That is not good. Is broken. So we need to get this thing out of here, and that's what we're gonna start with today. So let the party begin. Somebody's definitely been in here before because this bracket that is normally connected down here, somebody has cut through and made it easier to remove that bracket. That is definitely one of my complaints with uh, this engine. Uh, <laughs> they do not give you any room to get to that bolt down there. So it's actually kind of nice that they cut that off. So, but yeah, somebody's definitely been in here. All right, guys, this thing is already looking so much better. Frankly, GM did not do a great job of showcasing this engine. There's so much junk and garbage running over top of it, and you just can't, you can't argue with, uh, how good that engine looks with that little turbo hanging off the side. So I wanted to take this moment to sort of talk about some of the challenges that we are going to have coming forward. They're not really that big of a challenge, um, just some things we gotta overcome. Now I'm kinda treating this engine bay like a statue. We're gonna just keep chipping away rock and stuff that isn't needed until we end up with a uh, statue of David. So in the original configuration, we have the air intake and the uh, washer bottle assembly here in the front passenger side of the engine bay. We are going to be getting rid of that and probably going to a more compact unit so that we have plenty of room for our cold air intake. Additionally, we have the coolant reservoir here in the back passenger side of the engine bay. And uh, we're gonna be going to a more compact version of that as well. Also, we have our AC expansion tank here. Um, we're gonna have to sort of move it off to the side a bit to make room for our downpipe. That shouldn't be too bad. 
The heat goes in and out of the firewall on uh, these connections back here. And um, as you can see, the turbo is right here and the downpipe kind of has to go through that uh, same location there. That shouldn't be too big of a deal. I'm going to see if someone makes a push lock uh, style connection there um, that immediately goes to a 90 degree fitting and uh, with some heat shrouding and uh, some custom routing there, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. I am not too worried about it. In combination with uh, wrapping the downpipe and putting heat protection, kind of like the factory uh, coolant lines here already have on it, if we put some of that on it, that should solve uh, our issue there. Continuing with the AC, we will also have to take this uh, line from the compressor and I'm thinking about running it across the top of the uh, radiator support and then down to the compressor, which is now just hanging there off the uh, uh, lines there. The line coming up here to the condenser, that should all be fine, but uh, we'll probably have to weld some AN fittings onto um, that original connection there and onto there and then run a custom line down to the AC compressor. Not a big deal. As for the intake side of the engine, I was originally going to try to reuse the factory intake manifold. We have uh, boosted a factory intake manifold to 40 pounds of boost and it held it just fine. So we know that they are capable of holding all the boost I ever would want to with this combination, but they're just kind of ugly. So I am working on a solution there. As for the uh, cooling for the engine, um, once we got the uh, mechanical fan off the front of the engine, we've now freed up a ton of room up front. Um, and that was something I was a little bit worried about. Um, we should be able to uh, either move the radiator back a little bit with an electric fan and uh, figure out how to get an air-to-air -air intercooler in there, which is my goal. Additionally, the ECU, we should be able to just sort of turn the wiring around and make a little bracket and then bolt it to the fender rather than having it bolted to the uh, intake manifold. That is one of my most hated things about the 4200 in its natural environment. The last thing that we need to talk about is the power steering. The power steering reservoir is uh, sort of in this area and it definitely makes it hard to get a uh, cold air intake to the turbo. Um, I think we are probably going to end up going to an electronic power steering since we plan to run the uh, intake manifold here. Uh, we aren't going to have room for the alternators. We're probably going to use one of our alternator relocation kits, which puts the alternator here on the side of the engine. Now, what I am hoping to be able to do is get a power steering rack from a car that has electronic power steering. Uh, right now I am looking at the Ford F-150s. Um, hopefully they have the right configuration of uh, front steer and um, you know the right widths for the tie rod ends. Um, but uh, we should be able to find a solution there um, that we can make work. We could always run tie rod spacers if we need to. So hopefully we can figure out a solution there that is pretty seamless. Overall, I'm very happy with how this engine bay is starting to shape out. I was uh, kind of glad that uh, I've decided that we're not going to take a bunch of shortcuts because this is definitely the easiest way to uh, start hot rodding a 4200, um, being that it's already mounted, it already runs, it's already wired. So I definitely want to really do this one right and show you guys that you can build a cool hot rod with a trailblazer as well. And we're back for another exciting episode of... Noise. Last episode, we played this sound clip. That is not good. And we asked you... Noise. Today, we're gonna find out. Alright, one thing that's really common with 2008 Vortec 4200s is... Cracking the exhaust manifold. The 2008 and 2009 engines have a unique exhaust manifold, which 
basically merges the one, two, and three, and four, five, and six cylinders at a, um, a further down point. And we just discovered that our Trailblazer, it's cracked. So I wonder if this is where our noise is coming from. Let's find out. All right, I just globbed a bunch of this stuff down into the crack as much as I could. This is only temporary. I don't plan on reusing this exhaust manifold. I just want to see if the noise goes away. So let's let this cure up and see how it does. All right, let's see if it still makes noise. No, I don't think that's what it was. We are showing evidence of a pretty serious exhaust leak here, and I'm almost wondering, is that our noise? So I'm going to drop the oil filter and see if there is any metal shavings inside of it. And if there aren't, this could be our culprit. I don't see anything wrong with this. Other than... A little bit of dirt. Yeah. But 244,000 miles, I'm sure it's got a little bit of accumulation. I bet it's been uh, neglected too. Yeah. You know, I was visiting with the kid I bought it from. You know, I was telling him, oh, they're good engines. You just got to change the oil. Oh, and wow. then his mom, his mom's like, you see what, you hear what he said? You hear what he said? <laughs> so it wouldn't surprise me if this one got neglected. And... There is nothing in there. I know. I'm still 100% convinced that it's the exhaust manifold that was banging. Well, we'll find out here in a couple minutes. That's like clean as a whistle. Yeah. I wouldn't go that far. No. There's, there's some small stuff in there. But... Yeah, but nothing like you would see with a I'm, rod knock that I'm, bad. I'm, Drank, drank worse stuff than this. Yeah. Now, one of the common complaints on this engine is in order to get the front cover off to do like a timing chain or something like that, you have to uh, drop the oil pan. Now for as much of a pain as GM made this uh, chassis to work on, they did actually think some things through and you can actually take the oil pan off of the engine in chassis. A lot of cars, you can't do that. In fact, on our next race car with a 4200, this is something that I'd really like to have. Uh, you know, I'd like to be able to take the oil pan off and inspect the bearings and whatnot. So it's actually kind of cool that you can literally just take all of this factory bracing and stuff that bolts onto the bottom, and there's a cross member that goes across here, and all of that just unbolts, and you can just drop the oil pan. In fact, on a two-wheel drive vehicle, this would be even easier. The only minor challenge we're gonna have to deal with is the uh, front diff, which is hanging off the side. And since we found that exhaust leak, I am uh, I'm going to leave the engine in the chassis and we're gonna drop this and see if it has uh, a spun rod bearing. And uh, who knows, maybe the engine is still good. This might be wishful thinking, but <laughs> we'll give it a shot. You remember that thing I said earlier? You can actually take the oil pan off of the engine in chassis. Not this time. We created it. Not this time. No. Not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. Well, for 4x4 vehicles, that's not really true. I had to make some uh, modifications to get that uh, oil pan off.
the back of the pan. It's number six. How bad is it? Bad. Crank might not be bad, but the rod bearing is. Yeah. That's a bummer. Yeah. Hopefully the crank's still good though. your problem. Gotta go. Heavy. guys last episode i feel like i didn't do a really good job of explaining why we were redoing the whole front suspension of this car the thing that i majorly harped on was the bolt pattern of the wheels the factory stuff is this weird six lug pattern and i mentioned that we wanted to go to a more standard gm five lug pattern but we're doing it for more than just that um, all of the factory trailblazer stuff is designed for off-road use and uh, it's designed for a very heavy vehicle to go over big jumps and that kind of stuff and it's really heavy just in the front suspension components alone we are at 45 pounds of weight savings between this and the fourth gen stuff that we just bolted on and that's per side so it's a total of 90 pounds then you add in the wheels and we are going to see around a 25 pound weight savings per wheel then we add in all of the all-wheel drive components such as the diff and the axles the axles are 18 pounds a piece and the front diff is 44 pounds so we're already up around 200 pounds and we haven't even gone crazy yet uh, with all of the bracing and stuff underneath of the car that I want to cut out as well. So we are doing it for much more than just the bolt pattern. And I kind of wanted to just elaborate on that a little bit so that uh, you guys understood my point of view a little better. All right, guys, so that pretty much wraps up the video for today. We found the source of the knocking noise and unfortunately it is not something that is gonna be easy to fix, but that won't stop us. We'll put together a new engine for this car and we'll get this thing up and going very soon. Uh, Yay, Calvin! <laughs> we're not done yet. So make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe and we will see you in the next one.